Uh, first off, I want to thank all of you for being able to rally and make it here today. I heard last night was a uh, extraordinary event for many that I believe are still suffering the effects of. So I really appreciate you being here this morning. Um, I'm here to present the ARNO, Augmented Reality Nautilus, sometimes Network Observatory. And this is our open cyberspace platform for academia. And that will all be explained through the course of this lecture. To move on, I am John Payton. I'm currently a researcher with the University of California, San Diego, and I'm part of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. The ARNO project is a project that I lead as a collaboration as part of the PRP, what's now known as NRP, which is National Research Platform. And that is basically a system that's being built and explored across the US that uses high density, high throughput computing and data server centers at campuses all over that are fiber optically connected to do science research. I will get into that a little bit more. So this is the national uh, research platform. It's designed for growth and inclusion, meaning that we really target the ability to give some of these platforms that are typically inaccessible to universities and university students to do research on and exploration in the field. And so we leverage, uh, we're basically a cloud computing provider at this point that we call the Nautilus and all of this research is funded by the National Science Foundation. So Arno is a project that started originally for the PRP during the pandemic when they wanted to look at how we could leverage all of these GPU nodes and things that we're building in the cloud to do remote work particularly for our sysadmins, as we start to deploy equipment across the, the world and connected across the globe through federation, our system only has two system admins, one of them being located in New Mexico permanently now, thanks to COVID, uh, and one on site. And how do they work with somebody who's boots on the ground in a data center at a university that may or may not know anything? Because oftentimes we do work with like undergraduate workers that are just placed in the field. So what we did was we are creating a full ecosystem for virtual environments to leverage global distributed systems to perform scalability, data analytics, data processing for digital real-time data interactions and understandings. Lots and lots of data stuff, right, is the basis of what we do. So we deal with storage of storing data, moving data, and what do you do with data, of course. Um, our goals for our project were to build an open, our, our purview is actually to build open source tools for academics to use. So everything we do has to be something that could be provided out there. And this supports the arts and sciences, and we really hope that we can define how people can have a stake in the future of what we still call cyberspace, but other people know as the metaverse. Um, and we wanna make sure that that future is inside the hands of these creators. Most of these creators now in this space are very young, and so being within uh, uh, school institutions with large undergraduate base gives us a lot of leverage in the field there. So I'm, we're big in academia on terms and definitions, so I just wanna make sure you understand why we're using the word cyberspace for our system. And originally, uh, you guys, if you're, you're big science fiction fans, may know Neuromancer. And so the online world of computer networks, and especially the internet, the environment in which communication over computer networks occurs. Because in our foundation, we are a computer network with hardware on that network that leverages, we have chosen to continue using cyberspace. Anything else is just a layer above that. So um, we often see these synonymous terms. So you may see mirror world, digital twins, BIM, extended reality, augmented reality, and then some of the uh, other ones like Omniverse, which is NVIDIA's labeling of their kind of cyberspace system, mixed reality, which was originally done by Microsoft to separate themselves from the VR and AR spaces. And now Meta has adopted it for like pass through of digital cameras. Um, the metaverse, of course, you guys all know Meta with the, with the rebranding. Um, I, for, I don't know why I still have cyberspace in there, but then we also have Mesh, and Mesh is Microsoft's new labeling for their kind of ecosystem. So a lot of what we do, since I'm from the Arthur C. Clarke Center of Human Imagination, is we find inspiration from things like science fiction. And our chief systems engineer who co-leads this project with me of the Nautilus built the technology we have today to operate on because he was inspired by Werner Vinge's Rainbow's End. He read the book, which is this great speculative fiction of a future that only happens in 2025, of how technology works that we would call mixed reality, extended reality, or one of these other terms, and gives a wonderful overview that I don't think is beat to this day of what that world could be and what, uh, how to build it. So we looked at that and we decided to take from it the things that we saw as science fiction that we could turn into science reality. And that becomes a large backbone of the conceptual end of our system design. Um, 
and it also the original name of our project was called Librarium after Werner Vinge's book and a project. The benefit to us is this all happens in this novel on UCSD's campus. Werner is a UCSD alum who is a computer scientist at SDSC his whole career. And so for us, it's a great project to actually leverage for ourselves and a good history. So we are a research team. And so what we do is research. So it's a lot different than what other folks you may see at the conference here have done is that we're not trying to put out products. We're not here to work um, specifically on a device for industry, even though we do have industry partnerships. What we are here to do is explore. And the way that we explore is uh, usually by defining a problem first. So what is our problem that we set out to? I mentioned before we use this distributed NRP, which we now call Nautilus, and this is it, right? And this giant spaghetti monster of a thing is what we have to worry about for two individuals to maintenance on a daily basis that now goes all over the world with metered traffic because it's all fiber optically connected with MTU 9000 backbones, which I never knew anything about networks till three years ago. And now I know more than anybody needs to. Um, and so this was our problem. And the first thing that we thought was, why don't we put this into 3D and try to simplify it at different scales? But what we have is this infrastructure and I'll keep using that term in a couple of different ways. We have a cyber infrastructure, meaning we have hardware. We're the only group in the world that doesn't have to worry about hardware, right? We have over 1,000 GPUs at our fingertips. So that's not our problem. Our problem is what do we do with all that hardware and how do we actually start develop tools to start breaking down all of this complexity into something that people can take actionable work with using these mixed spaces. Um, just to, to a point in fact, this is from two days ago. Currently, we have 775 GPUs and over 11,000 uh, CPU cores, not to mention all the RAM. We have seven petabytes of NVMe storage that we can have access to that's all in uh, Western and Eastern pools, all this stuff that's fun and technical. By the end of this year, the GPU number will be well over 1,000, and that includes the new, I believe, A40s or A100s that are MIG sliceable, so we can start scaling that and composing to have upwards of like 10,000 GPU instances for smaller jobs like machine learning. And that's what happens on our network, is we provide academia the tools to do machine learning, digital rendering, anything that you might need these for. Our problem, like you saw, is that big giant cluster of information. And because we are using non-normative racks, it's not typical data centers we're in, this is what people see when they walk into it, right? This is a mess. And I had never been into a data center until this project, and I've been in multiple ones. Some are much nicer than others, but this is what we typically deal with. So our system was really built to address how we're gonna walk somebody through this using our data analytics um, with the higher end view where we have the software layers that we use for evaluation. All right, so that means we had to use system design thinking, which fortunately we're specialists in, and we start by breaking it down into four categories, conceptual categories of what we need to address within our system. So one is content delivery. The other one is the social aspect because it's not inherently a single player thing. Uh, the uh, third is data services because we have tons and tons of data that needs to be digested. And the third one will be asset, basically what sits inside of that and how do we manipulate assets within the environment. This then follow, trickles down into our system requirements. So what are we required within our Nautilus system to address? And that would be all of our pipelines, which you see that's where our assets, our BAM, things like point clouds, our different data types can come in. We, use, we require the use of REST services because those are the things we can stand up and the way that we can access them through APIs. Localization and persistence, meaning that I've got to deal with data here and it's got to be there when I come back, right? So we have to have a means of uh, leaving and coming back to it. We deal with our uh, shared systems, meaning our servers, how the interconnectivity can be used and scaled through our cloud operations, storage types. We have lots and lots of ways to move data and store data. Um, we also require it to be system agnostic, right? This is a lot of stuff. Dev tools, streaming services, continuing research, and the most important one is our last one, is that everything we do is open source and it's built to be community leveraged so that we have to be able to provide back to the community at the same time build a community to work with us. And so from there, our system design and our, our concepts and our system requirements, we can start looking at things at scale. So we do host a, a world scale digital twin and that becomes part of it. Our system now is connected to Korea, Guam, Hawaii, Australia, England, and the Netherlands, right? So we're dealing with a global distribution. 
And for that, there's going to be different data that has needs at different scales. And so what we've done is broken it from a world scale down to different levels, from a geo-regional, whether or not it be the southeast, it be Canada, uh, like Alberta area. We can then break it down into like city and regional county views, uh, to buildings, to rooms and buildings like this one. And for our needs, we go all the way down to a single pin on the Ethernet port. So that's the level of fidelity that our system has to have. Uh, for us, we developed our workflow. So this is what we know that we're going to be addressing through the research where we're gonna start. Our starting point for our linear process is gonna be data. We're gonna have to process that data. We'll have to have a single unit that becomes our crux, which is Unreal Engine, for digesting and interpreting that data and delivering it to users. Then we have our server side that's gonna be scalables, which we uh, have implemented Agons as our scaler within Kubernetes. And then of course the endpoint for any of this is going to be the user, you, me, anybody else. And then we're gonna have recursive systems that feed back. Our backbone for our infrastructure that we can build on is our Kubernetes-based system, and we host our own storage. We have the S3 protocol by AWS, so it's unique that we have our own S3 storage that we can leverage, and we currently use Docker images to help run all of that. We host our own tools in the cloud that are served up through the web, from, uh, so our GitLab, is in-house, and so all of our work can be done inside GitLab almost exclusively from the web. And then, of course, this all runs on the top of Linux machines. We do uh, almost no Windows virtualization. All right, so that's going to lead me to the Arno app. First off, I'm gonna take a little break here. How many of you guys know or have used Kubernetes before? I have one. All right, so Kubernetes is like this brand new orchestration that is the backbone for almost all cloud service providers. So we're gonna break away so much from the cloud service side and get into the XR side. So in the end, what we do in our lab for Arno in particular is use those things and address them through XR. So our extended reality. And um, for that, we have been developing what's known as the Arno app to address all of those problems using these system design requirements. And so let's just jump in. Our first deliverable is content delivery. And our system requirement for this is it has to be system agnostic, meaning that we can't prioritize one way of interacting with material over the other. And so we do support PC, VR, AR, and browser, and we do believe we've now achieved full system agnostics. Uh, agnosis is probably the word. Um, and here's a little bit of a flowchart diagram showing how that these things link together. Linux plays a big role because of Kubernetes, and it has been one of the things that we love to support, and we know will eventually reach broader um, cohesiveness within the community, but it's still within this world of XR and gaming, a little bit left behind. Uh, so with this in our system agnostics, we, like I said, we do support desktop, VR, AR, browser right now. We only support desktop Linux and desktop Windows. We are able to be agnostic by supporting browser through two methods, which one is pixel streaming made by Unreal, and the other one is XGL Selkies, which we've developed in-house with our partners in our community. So what you see here are viewports from people in the same scene. So we use the EOS subsystem, which I'll go into a little bit in a minute, as our uh, server stack. But we do support currently users that are in VR, that are in AR using the Microsoft HoloLens, as well as default desktop and the pixel streaming on the bottom right. And so the three that you see for AR, VR, and desktop are all in the same instance right now. So all three of these users use the Colab Viewer template as our base, which also comes from Unreal, um, to deliver this. So the, I mentioned that we are able to deliver content through the web browser, which any, any web browser, um, using pixel streaming, which is an image and game protocol by Unreal, which if you're unfamiliar with some of these, I highly recommend because they're amazing tools. The other option is um, our GLX desktop. And so we had been working on this through NoVNC for many years, and it was unfortunately running in privileged states. And then the hero of our story came in, which is Sungmin Kim, a collaborator from South Korea, known as EHFD. And he developed all the ways to basically work his magic to diff the drivers that are needed for screens into a container so that we have a full Ubuntu 22.04 desktop running with GPU acceleration that we can now compose inside of the cloud and deliver that through a uh, Selkies WebRTC stack. Okay. So, um, and I put links there to that. What we have been doing is working to extend this. So through that, I can give a full Linux desktop with Unreal environment to anybody with a web browser, including the Amazon Fire Stick. 
We're in education. We looked at this as a way to distribute, trying to distribute content to students who may or may not be able to come back from like the pandemic or who may be working at institutions that don't have the ability to offer computer labs and services. So Nautilus as a platform is open to any and all academic out there. So, oh, that one's not auto-playing. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back. I jumped one. Um, I'm not sure why this one is not playing, but this should be playing a video. We are now working on a method of using these uh, EGL Selkies desktops to stream over the network to Oculus Quest to deliver our VR content. And our working prototype of this works pretty well. The only thing that matters at the moment is your distance from the server, so basically your home network and how fast your bandwidth is versus how fast the network can actually deliver it to you from the content source. So on campus, we can get like 120 frames per second, but uh, going out to where this uh, young developer is working on in North Carolina, he gets about 60 and he does some downsampling, but he is able to play in full VR games running in the cloud container. So the other partner that we use for delivering content is, this is a new one, this is a, a small startup called Juice Labs that does composable GPUs over IP. What this means is that you can connect a GPU to any home computer that's running Windows and accelerate it with that GPU. So they're doing a lot of testing with us because we have lots of GPUs and, and things like students. And particularly with the Arno group, I had one of my summer interns that didn't have a powerful enough PC at home that use Juice the entire summer to do development to great success. We're also looking at how this can scale into Linux clients, and we can be able to con potentially connect those to containers for other services. And it doesn't just matter for things like graphics operations, it matters for machine learning, it potentially can matter for things like Bitcoin trading. Because you don't use 100% of your GPU in most tasks, and Juice allows you to connect and kind of scale the use of other tasks for that GPU, which is pretty amazing. Um, all right, so that's our content delivery side. So hopefully that was informative to you all. And the next one we're gonna talk about is a little bit of our social, right? Uh, I have a lot of study in uh, social theory. That was part of my master's, which was in arts in uh, XR, and how we think about social interactions and environments. Because social self theory says that there is no sense of self without another. So inherently everything that we do on earth is social. So for that, we particularly talk about multiplayer where multiplayer was one of the reasons we chose Unreal, is Unreal offers out of the box its EOS subsystem, which is great and has a lot of base code. After there, it starts getting very hard running those examples. And because we tend to work exclusively with undergraduates running courses that do experimental outreach to help us decide what content we're gonna pursue next or tackle challenges, um, we ended up trying the Red Point system, which is a plugin that's offered through the marketplace, and it's phenomenal. And their team has been really helpful in giving us feedback. We've since scaled up past a little bit as we gain knowledge from what the base uh, Redpoint offers, which is what you see on the left-hand side. This is kind of what they can support out of the box. Uh, and with that, we were able to take what th we learned from them and doing things like uh, qualifying users through uh, Discord or Epic and build our own custom authentication graph that uses CI logon, our open ID. And this is extremely important for us to be able to deliver to education because every academic university, particularly in the US for the most part, uses this to authenticate users. So if you are at a university as a professor, a researcher, a partner, or a student, they give you an open ID account. And by adding this to Arno, we are now able to create, you are now automatically a user if your school gave you a school account. And so it doesn't make us have to go out and assign everybody dependencies. And since we use the OpenID CI logon across all of our other tools that we provide through Nautilus, we're working on a system to connect those and to our Kubernetes namespaces to help qualify permissions. So that when you log in, eventually you will also come in with your permissions to other tools to help give you privacy and save data spaces. Um, so we just see that working here. The social aspect for us, like we said, is we had to be able to put people together from all these different systems. So if I want somebody in AR, I want somebody in VR, and I want somebody on desktop, how do I get them there? And the answer to that, as I mentioned before, was Unreal's CoLab Viewer template, which you see here. That one didn't support augmented reality. However, they did have an AR viewer template. And what we've done through the, the massive work of our lead developer, Giovanni, is he's been able to continue expanding these templates 
until we can add the HoloLens player with all of its interactions into the network system. So this is just us showing off the early days with a simple template viewer. You'll notice their avatars. And what we've done in our current state is got to where we can implement this fully into fi Unreal 5.1. Our 5.0 will have 5.1 up in a few weeks uh, with an avatar system, which we're using Ready Player Me, but we can use any avatar that we get parsed or passed. So within that, we are able to replace the base mesh and the base animations to match for all of these systems. And so this is just, if you're unfamiliar, Ready Player Me is an open source group that provides an avatar maker. And we are firm believers that not everybody wants to be a cartoon, but a lot of people do. And this is a really great group of people that offer an open source platform for that. You can see uh, at the very bottom there, in the middle is one of our uh, student interns who's done a lot of the heavy lifting with this mega. So we have lots of partnerships in academia and outside. One of our current partners that's helping us do active development is uh, Dr. Neil Smith, who just came back to UCSD recently, and he's been developing this cyber archaeology warehouse, and the technology is we do a lot of base sharing. He is an Unreal expert, and uh, they have a really amazing pipeline that we'll eventually add as well to Arno that uses uh, point cloud voxelization to bring in really large point cloud data that's streaming. And we've been working with them specifically on the uh, containerization of streaming the, uh, the XR environments, but as well as um, we have been developing a system to deliver content, which I'll, I'll get in a little bit by sim linking to external databases into our content folder for runtimes. So I'll probably get into that here. So that was our social aspect. So how we kind of start thinking about it. On top of the rest of the social aspect, we're now getting to the point where our functionality is being stabilized. And that's where we get to run experiments about what we can do. How do we play together, right? What does it mean to actually coexist? So for us, we are able to frame that around our case use of going into a server center and communicating with a sysadmin. But as soon as that functionality is developed, we open that up to see what else we can do. Where else this can be used potentially in classrooms, for education, for industry, are just for play, for anybody who wants to go out there and try. Our major, what we would call bread and butter um, efforts have to do with our data services. And for our data services, we f fall under the category that we try to propel called procedural reality. There's lots and lots of realities out there. You know, there's AR, VR, MR, XR. We're adding PR. Does anybody know what RR is? Real reality. And I thought that never had to be said, but apparently it does because it's in every academic paper I see lately. And so what procedural reality is, and this is really the name of our game, and what we're looking to do is persistent gaming. And persistent gaming requires the data come in. And that data is going to then affect things procedurally. And so for this, we deal with either real time or in time sequence data, um, our assets that can be presented from cyberspace to real space through data pipelines. So our cyberspace is our network, data comes in from the network, and we eventually get that data, and it specifically in our system has, a, has a, a set location in the real world that it affects. And so that's what we mean when we say that we're taking it from cyberspace to real space. Even if it's virtually displayed, it's correlating to a position on the planet. And so we're procedurally generating that in different time series. And it comes a lot into our system design where we have to think about what it means to get data in time because real time is like this obsession within the graphics community of what you can deliver content in, but some content just can't operate like that when it comes to data. And what does that mean for how often you need to refresh and how you then use those systems to interact with when we go back to our social understanding? So for our needs, since we use a lot of REST services that we build and host in our cluster, we had originally started with this VA REST plugin, which has really phenomenal tutorials for learning to get started. But that wasn't enough because we had so many assets and so many calls, it was starting to bog down our instances of our builds. So we had a, uh, who's now one of our uh, STEs, which is a temporary full-time employee, um, Matthew Zane built us a plugin use, converting REST calls to C++ structs in Unreal so that when we do get multiple streams of data, we convert those to structures that can run asynchronously in the background without bogging down the game and be cross compared so that we can actually start digesting them in a way that makes sense for visualization and understanding. 
Uh, that has not been released because it uses some of our custom tokens that are, un that are privileged. Eventually, we're hoping to develop Resly so that it is more accessible to a greater community. Some of the data that we had to build that for to digest comes from our network. So inside the network, they use this stuff called Ansible scripting, which gives you tons and tons of metrics, because that's what we get paid to do, is to be a scientific metering service for the PRP. And we partner with other companies like Qualcomm's Gradient Graph, who's using machine learning to look at like trace pathing and network congestion. Really, really, really nerdy stuff that they love, and I love it for them. Because it's a, I can see their excitement in the room, and I'm just like, oh my god, oh my god, do I need to know all this? Um, but I do. And we do need to know it because we have to display it on top of our digital twin to give people data at scale. And so what you'll see is we do digest all of this and process it, and we can showcase what the traffic is, uh, traffic in time sequence. So we'll say live, but the snapshots may update every 15 minutes to an hour. Um, and so with that, we can show whether or not something is up, something is down, if the traffic is congested, congested, as well as we can partner it with all of our data centers around the world so we know which one is having an issue. Um, one of the foundationary services to this is something called Netbox. So if you have data, you need a database somewhere for it. Uh, if, it's, if it's doing like what uh, Gradient Graph is doing, which is digesting snapshots and producing them, isn't specifically a database as much as it is kind of like a spreadsheet generator for us at the moment, how we interact with it. But we need to know where stuff is at all times, so we have a needed inventory database that can be automated and can interact with other data sources. And this is where the Netbox project came in for us. And this is an infrastructure resource modeling tool, which means that this is specifically built for data centers to be able to deploy through namespaces and get information that the admins have put on it. And that becomes an inventory list for us, for our network, so we know where every device is on every campus. And this is infinitely extendable with metadata. So this becomes a key component to our workflow for knowing where physical infrastructure is and its location. And it also gives us a platform because it uses a common tree structure for digesting fields that we can start nesting data based on that structure. And uh, that implements how we deal with our digital twin and how we think about those scales that I talked about before. And that's what I'll, I'll show pretty quickly here. This may take a second to run. So Netbox has labels like regions, locations, uh, sites, and then devices. And each one of these you can think about as almost like a zoom tier for where you need to be in the world to see that particular information. So as it fires up, we get information from our network. That network, uh, those REST APIs then come, calls come into Unreal. We also query Netbox itself. We compare the things we're getting from our data services to the things that we have inside of our Netbox instance. And then we are able to visually draw and display that live and manipulate it. So if something is wrong inside the game, we can recursively update the databases. Meaning you can click on it, you can annotate, and you can move around. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in the asset section about the fact that maybe a little bit later that we do use GIS programs like Cesium Ion as well as our Esri Arc GIS and some custom ones. And so what you see here is just us interacting with that data at different scales and how we can automate those features and get information. Uh, this just shows what Netbox looks like. Not very exciting, so I think we can skip on. And so when we talked about the beginning, the, the difference in scale, once we're at a region scale, we go into UCSD's campus, which may be a site scale. So we've built a pretty accurate digital twin of our campus specifically, and we focused on a few spe uh, specific buildings to be really high resolution, which you see here. But we're able to ominously display the flying saucer of data above where the data center is. And um, from there, with our new updates, which aren't in these slides, we're able to actually go directly into the data center to the device that may be having a problem. And so this system, doesn't just work with us, right? This is extendable to a broader community to use for whatever they want to use this purpose for, if they want to start thinking about the world at scale. All right, some more Netbox stuff that's pretty boring that shows the devices. So what's interesting for us is uh, originally we had really high resolution racks that we tried to put in there and put our data uh, inside of all of these um, uh, server units, which you see. So it's a data center, and we decided that since we don't have every make and model of everything, we're just going to start using a way to design in real space what those units should be and label them. So this is every piece of hardware inside of this particular room on campus, 
you may see a virtual building, but within NetBox, we have geo-referenced it, and so this room is where it is at within two centimeters in the real world. So if I am standing in the real world in this room, and somebody is working on data on those servers, uh, in those server centers, they are working with it in my same geolocation. So we're cross-compiling that data. So just because you're in a virtual environment doesn't mean it doesn't relate to here and now. So that's when we go back to our idea of persistence. We do use a QR code system that's embedded that we auto-generate, and this helps us store that metadata and, and check it through other systems. Okay, um, this just shows you that we can store all of the, that server data inside of NetBox, so this is the type of stuff that we're pulling in, and our next iteration of it actually pulls in all of these image stacks so that I can annotate directly on top of the position in space so that whoever is working on the ground knows exactly what port I'm talking about they need to uh, click, which button they need to push to power cycle. So this goes into our system diagram, and this is really, really important. So we've realized that NetBox serves is our ability to start creating that spatial persistence uh, math. And there's lots of things out there within AR and VR talking about spatial anchors, and they use proprietary systems. And we're like, how do we do something that's open source and that is repeatable as a standard? And so because NetBox has this region, site, location, rack, device architecture, then we can use that to actually put that positional metadata that's not gonna change. So in our kind of what we call semi-dynamic, um, our slow dynamic obstacle or objects like server racks, they're likely not going to change, but they're guaranteed to change in their lifetime, their position. We can actually change and update positions about once an hour. And so for things that aren't gonna be updated that quickly, like this room, that's a really good system and a really good rate to do that. For anything that needs to be updated faster than that, we can just do in the server itself. And what we've done is we've extended NetBox to use the geo-referencing and Unreal World Space. Because our math on our geo-referencing is very accurate, then our world space coordinates for Unreal should match up with real world positions. Uh, for, we're still in data services. Let me check my time. Um, so this is something that's pretty cool that we've been working on recently that we think is a big deal. And this is uh, delivering content into Unreal Engine, even built games from distributed storage. And these use, uh, this one is originally using an async library and it delivers content over HTTPS. And so you don't have to actually have it locally to run it. And we use our clone, which is uh, a CLI tool for connecting to databases like AWS S3 storage to do this. Now, what we are doing with this project, and we don't have an active slide for it yet, is we have been able to symlink to our databases using what looks like a fuse mount system into our content browser. So our S3 storage, which is high performance and very fast, looks like it's running locally to Unreal when the game builds. And so if we already have pre-compiled U assets, we actually just populate those U assets to where they need to be. And then if we drop the game and restart the game, we can swap out that U asset with the same naming convention. And we can update it that way. And this is one of the ways that we're able to distribute content across multiple users. Because um, when you do with the server stack and you're starting to think about ways of doing replication, this changes the options we have for replication methods across users. And again, this uses our Ceph storage protocol pool with Amazon AWS is the class. We don't actually run this in Amazon AWS. Um, they invented this class of storage, but they do support it themselves. So if you're not working, if you're working in another cloud, it would work there as well. All right, now we're going to go into assets, which I believe is our last one. And so for this one is where we deal with kind of our themes around mirror worlds, digital twins, and our BIM data, our architectural data. So digital twins and mirror worlds. So we go back to thinking about our system design and our system requirements. And so you'll see that the very top one is our world scale that we think about this for our digital twin. World scale, geo scale, and city scale. These we use GIS data specifically for, and that's integrated. And that's where our ArcGIS, um, our cesium ions, as well as our other geo-referencing data comes into play. The one here for architecture on room scale, we start to look at things like different pipelines in the game space where we use uh, different asset methods to bring it in. Our big one is using Autodesk Revit to rebuild building models, and we have a whole data pipeline I'll show to bring those in, and that deals with most of our room scale and sets its position on Earth. 
uh, as well as then we have small assets. And small assets that you see here come from traditional workflows, either like AutoCAD units that export out as FBX or OBJ, anything from Maya, Blender, uh, Houdini, whichever software you use to create those assets. So um, we use, as I mentioned before, to host our global twin. This is, we rely a lot on our cesium ion and ArcGIS services. We don't typically run the two together, but we can run them side by side and kind of turn them on or off. We do a lot with cesium because it allows us to do streaming of tiles, so streaming data, and we can do uh, updated personal, um, I'm sorry, uh, the updated data sets that we do in academia. So we actually build custom GIS data sets and we can digest them into Unreal by these other different methods. If we do a lot with building architecture and modeling, one of the things you can do at that scale is cesium ion has a really nice GLTF uh, runtime loader that loads things in and out dynamically to your scene. So uh, what we've worked with is the cesium team has been extremely responsive for the Unreal side in the community, and we've had to invent ways to actually use it at the campus level to do multiplayer. And so we recently, our, chief develop, our lead developer worked with them to develop a system of virtualizing cameras because we use sublevels to load our big high resolution models on top of our uh, medium resolution GLTF models to get higher fidelity. And to preload those submodules, you have to do a lot of work with uh, different virtualized cameras and to make sure that they're there when we get there. And so that's what you see here is this camera array that uh, occupies the entirety of our campus, which is a little more than five miles in, uh, across. And so from that side of things with our digital twin, where we can put in everything from our elevation data at the geo scale, we step down into our building scale. And for, I mentioned we use Autodesk Revit, and we had uh, recruited an amazing architecture intern who worked with us for two years to develop a pipeline. It's not enough just to take it from the software and drop it in. It actually has to be done in a way that we can use and digest for our data services. And so what he's done is he's spent a lot of time investigating DataSmith and particularly data prep from 4.25 all the way up to 5 now uh, and how you can use recipes to pre-format your buildings as they export. So once they're in Unreal, they're in the, the method that we want to use. And for us in particular, we don't just want a building, right? We care about telecommunications, we care about infrastructure. So with this, everything is broken into a US set and based on class so we can query it. So we can query the room, we can query the port inside the room. So if we wanna look at internet traffic, eventually we'll be driving it from the server, from the switch, into the wall and across the cable trays. And this would apply to anything else you want as a form of wayfinding. So if you just wanna know how to get from point A to point B and traverse a 3D landscape, it can deliver that content to you in the future. These are just some of our pretty pictures that you see. And the nice thing is it helps us go ahead and predefine colliders. Um, you, we did some experiments with Nanite. Unfortunately, because we're cross-platform, Nanite doesn't support everything that we support, so we're waiting on those updates. But we are really looking forward to the development of Nanite in this direction in the future. And uh, the uh, ability to render, if we turn on ray tracing, gets us to what we start to consider photorealistic. And so this is where our compute infrastructure in the future really comes into play, as we deliver stuff over different methods or run it locally. You know, if I need to, I can throw 10, 30, 90s at something right now, right? In January, I could throw 100. So um, it's not really a question for us about rendering and all of that or compute power. We'll scale as needed and do research there. And so in the meantime, we do like to put out a bunch of pretty photos. So there's this whole realm. I was just talking to a gentleman who gave a talk yesterday, and I apologize for getting his name, about digital photography and what's the future of digital photography. And it's clear to me that it's going to be there. Um, here, I just to show the, the types of models that we can digest is we use Blender a lot because Blender is open source and free, and that also has a Linux build, so we can deliver Blender with graphics acceleration to anybody we want through our EGL containers, and we can put them at any level. We can also deliver Houdini as well. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about, because we talk about assets, I believe, oh no, I'm sorry, there's two more fields, is uh, this goes back to eventually all of our system design, but we use the web browser widget to deliver tools. So the Unreal Engine web browser widget had a massive upgrade in five, 
and allows you to actually uh, go in and view Node.js no sites now because they updated the Chromium backend, I believe. And with that, we host tools inside of our cluster, as I mentioned. So we host our GitLab, our uh, matrix element, which is our chat protocol, as well as all of these other, like a, a 3D modeler based on SculptGL, and all of our other data services for visualizing our data. The way that we deliver that content now to you in game is through the web browser widget. And this is super important because this means that while I'm inside looking at something live, I may want to make a change. Our uh, GitLab has its own CI runners for doing compiling. So we can code inside of the, the interface, save it, and then we can wait, take the game down, restart the game, and see an update. Or if it's for one of our REST services, any change to the REST service will update within whatever frequency it's updating inside the game. And it's different for each service. Um, so in this way, you can actually start doing a lot of meta work where you're actually working on the system from inside the system. In addition, I can give you multiple copies of the game from inside the game because we can pixel stream and run EGL and deliver it in game through the browser. So you start doing some really, really crazy things at this level. And this is where I see in particular, because I do a lot of uh, the critical engagement with the students as they start like going like, I can't, I can't. And I'm like, go watch Inception, come back, <laughs> right? And then you'll kind of know what we're doing. And so we have built this and extended the Colab Viewer uh, plugin to incorporate this. So we have active and inactive states so we can turn it on or off. And when I say for our social design, this is important. This isn't important because we want you to be able to work on these things from inside the game. It's important because inside of the XR space, a lot of people are turned off by headsets. And even though we're giving them a 2D game, some people don't care about a 2D game. What they do want in the end is to be able to open a flat window and type on their keyboard. So in this way, we don't want to leave out the largest user base, as well as people who may feel left out by this form of technology. This is specifically our way of incorporating all of the tools we build and bringing them with us. So like I could teach my mom, maybe teach my mom how to come in and use this. She would at least know how to open a web browser. Uh, with that, in terms of Asset creation, the other one we look at are different procedural workflows within our procedural reality. This is one super cool and fairly new to us. They released it uh, just before the summer. Is It's using the Niagara system and cesium ion to do classification of images and then procedural generation of objects from those images. And what we did is uh, we had a, another Stellar intern that specifically built this pipeline for us that uses all of our foliage classification from around campus to procedurally generate trees. And we do use Quixel Bridge and Megascans. And um, I can go over the hurdles of that. But what you see in the bottom right is the classification that we get back. And this is important because we have tons and tons of foliage classification in California for wildfires. And so what we want to look at is within this is we can generate um, different objects, and then we can perform simulation on those objects. And our goal is here in the next year or so to continue developing this to where we can do simulations on wildfire in the Arno system. And what that means is then, because it uses persistence in space, that you can actually go on site and see what that may or may not look like. Right? We actually have a system of delivering Wi-Fi to these HP Wren towers so that you could be in the middle of a few places in national parks and get one gigabit Wi-Fi and then you could run this locally and connect. Um, and this is just a, another viewpoint of it that talks how it works. So we do use Niagara for the classification, but we don't have to. We can actually just pass in classification as well, since we already have it. And this goes back to some of those databases like Cesium and ArcGIS. If you, you can host your own tile servers, or what they call it, and we can populate those tile servers with our data so they just run for everybody. And it's one of the ways that we could deliver content we could afford the service. Um, last thing I will talk about before we wrap this up, and I think I have plenty of time, is everything we do is technically live and open source. So our, we host our own GitLab. This is it. We pride ourselves on education. So what we try to do is make documentation so that the rest of the world can, can re reproduce what we do and learn. So um, we will be, this is our official like public release to everybody that we exist is this event. We do have a release for our internal partners that's a private beta. We will be doing a public alpha of uh, Arno in about probably uh, early January after the new year. In the meantime, anybody that's interested, 
in becoming a research partner, a business partner, our corporate partner. Our program is going from, a, our, our Arno project is going from a project into a full program to help support education and research. And so if you're interested in any of this, please feel free to contact me. Um, if you want to follow our progress, this is our GitLab. If you, uh, you can visit Arno Web, which will be constantly updated as we get closer to our public release with more and more content, as well as if you want to join in the discussion, we use Matrix Element as our chat service. It's kind of like Slack or Discord that we host ourselves, and this is the chat room that you're welcome to join. Um, I could not have done any of this. This is a three-year effort where nobody knew Unreal Engine before we started, and our full-time development team never exceeds three people. So this is only possible because we have designed a course structure, an experimental course structure for research with Unreal at the university that we'd run a few times a year, that we're able to go and see what students can explore, get them educated in the space, and then uh, move them into different avenues where they can apply this within labs or industry. And so what you see here is uh, myself and John Graham are the two project leads. Our lead developer, Gio Vindiola, who's like our Sisyphus, always pushing our rock up the hill for us. Um, and then we've had staff developers, which are usually short time hires to wrap something up after they've graduated, um, as well as the PI, since we are part of the, the PRP, NRP, um, are Tom DeFonte and Larry Smarr. So we have a system of undergraduate developers who come from our REU program. So this is like a paid internship through the NSF to work with us, as well as uh, what you see below are our academic interns, so the ones that come in through our course program and help us explore. And unfortunately, I don't have all of their names from like the years prior. This is just in the last year. And so with that, I think I will open the floor up to questions. <laughs>